Okay, we got some footage here of Tyson Fury. This is recent footage, and it is from David Adelaide's Instagram page. David Adelaide obviously is in training camp with Tyson Fury. And judging by this video, Fury looks to be very light here, at least from this angle. And I know the camera can be deceiving. I've spoken about this many times before. But from this angle, when we do have a full length shot here, Tyson Fury looks, I'm not saying he is, but he looks to my eye to be lighter than he was for his past two fights. And that would be suggestive of a Tyson Fury who intends to stick and move here. Maybe not to the extent that he did against Klitschko, but certainly someone who intends to use his height and reach and not give Dylan White chances that he doesn't need to give him, i.e. trade up close where Dylan White will be able to hit him with his shots more easily. So let me know what you guys think about this. And also to kind of back up this idea that Tyson Fury is probably going to try to keep it long. His dad did an interview with TalkSport, which I did a separate video about. And he said that the only chance Dylan White really has is up close in a trade-off. And he, again, insinuated or suggested that Tyson Fury is going to keep it long and box. So, yeah, that seems to be what Tyson Fury will probably do. Although he's an erratic character, he might go in there and because he's got uh, Sugar Hill Stewart in his corner, who is, of course, the crunk trainer that took over from his uncle, Manny Stewart, and their philosophy is always go for the knockout. So with that guy in his corner, Tyson Fury might just catch a vibe and say, you know what? Nah, man, forget about the boxing. Forget about keeping it long. I'm going to go in there and knock this guy out early. And there are certainly people in Tyson Fury's camp who believe that he can get a knockout win over Dylan White in relatively short order. I think Joseph Parker is picking Tyson Fury to win around the midway stage. And you've even got Dylan White's old trainer, Mark Tibbs, picking Tyson Fury to win. And you see, this is why, uh, look, I, I don't blame Mark Tibbs for picking Tyson Fury to win over his old charge, but boxing is a business. And so even if a trainer doesn't think you can win the fight, he'll usually tell you that you can win the fight because you're giving him a paycheck. That's what boxing is. So I know you guys are sick of hearing me bang on about the way there's no room for loyalty in boxing. Think about it. Mark Tibbs was with Dylan White for all that time. And, well, some people could argue, well, if, if he was still with Tibbs, Tibbs might feel he'd be able to change Dylan White enough to get him the victory. Well, I don't believe that. I don't think Mark Tibbs ever believed that Dylan White could beat Tyson Fury. Maybe Dylan White caught that vibe off Mark Tibbs. Maybe that's why he's not with Mark Tibbs anymore. But, like I say, this is another example of why as a fighter, there's no room for being loyal to trainers and promoters and managers and all this kind of stuff. You have to believe in yourself and you have to look out for number one, your best interests. Because all those other people, they're still going to be able to train somebody else or manage somebody else or promote somebody else after your career is over and done with. So you have to take care of yourself and loyalty cannot, you know, loyalty will only ever be a barrier to you taking care of yourself in this boxing game. And I'm not talking about in life in general, because in life in general, of course, loyalty is very important. But in boxing, it's a business. So don't get too hung up on all this loyalty stuff that promoters try to fill your head with so they, they can control you. But anyway, uh, Tyson Fury looks to be light here, looks to be... In fact, there was another point I wanted to make there uh, regarding Dylan White and... Uh, the, the loyalty thing and Mark Tibbs and all the people thinking he's going to lose. Dylan White will probably just use this for motivation. You know, probably thinks that he made the right decision in parting from Tibbs. And perhaps, I, I don't know, maybe the guys that he's with now are just telling him what he wants to hear as well. But perhaps he's with people who actually believe, genuinely believe he can win rather than just saying that he can because they're collecting a paycheck. You know, Cus Tomato the famous trainer of Mike Tyson and Jose Torres and Floyd Patterson, he was well known for protecting his fighters. And there's an honesty in that because he would never put 
this is well known about Costamato. He would never put one of his fighters into a fight that he didn't genuinely think they could win or genuinely think that they had a very good chance of winning. He wouldn't put them in there. That's why he kept Floyd Patterson away from Sonny Liston for so long. He didn't want Patterson to fight Liston. Patterson was upset with Costamato because he didn't feel like a real champion because of the fact that Costamato was protecting him. But again, Costamato didn't feel honest. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Putting his guy in there against someone who he clearly believed would smash his guy to pieces. You see it? So you have to really uh, respect Costamato for that, actually, for protecting his fighters and looking out, genuinely looking out for their best interests, at least in that regard, in terms of matchmaking. Uh, obviously, we don't like to see protected fighters as fans, but from a boxer's perspective, it's good to see a, a, a manager, etc., who actually cares about your welfare and wants to keep you undefeated. He's not going to just put you in there against stiffs because, of course, Floyd Patterson fought plenty of tough guys. You know, those fights with Inga Mario Hansen and so on. But he knows when there's certain opponents that are a bridge too far. Costamato knew there were certain, certain opponents that were a bridge too far, and that was certainly the case with Sonny Liston. So, uh, yeah, that's just a, <laughs> a little sidetrack there. But getting back onto the main topic, the way Tyson Fury looks here, in great shape, and I'm anticipating that he is going to probably move, try and frustrate Dylan White, try and walk Dylan White onto shots. Uh, I, I don't, again, I don't necessarily think he's going to do the old stuff like what he did against Vladimir Klitschko. Not unless he gets hurt or dropped early, then he might revert to that kind of thing. But yeah, I suspect he's going to keep it long, use his height and reach, try and frustrate Dylan White, try and get him to swing, which Dylan White often does. He'll swing wildly, you know, for a wild overhand right. So he'll even swing himself off balance with the left hook. I think he'll try to get, uh, you see, I think he wants to frustrate Dylan White because the more he frustrates him, the more he'll make mistakes. And the more mistakes he makes, the more Tyson Fury can capitalize. You see it. So that's what I'm anticipating from this fight. I think that Dylan White is going to have to be very effective with his jab if Tyson Fury is going to move around and he's going to have to be patient, not get frustrated. And I think the most important thing for Dylan White is to make sure that his own defense is sound. Use the jab. You see, the jab itself can be used as a defense because if you're constantly focusing on moving your head and hitting your opponent with a jab coming forward, he can't just throw whatever he wants when he's having a you know, big ramrod jab hitting him in the face every time he tries to set something up. You see it? So that, that's going to make him think more. That's going to make him uh, hesitant. And therefore, it can act as a defense. Sometimes offense is defense, but you have to have smart offense. It can't be reckless offense, particularly not against a guy like Tyson Fury. And so I think Dylan White's jab will be important. The jab to the head, you've got to be careful with the jab to the body because Tyson Fury can come over the top with the right hand. He's not necessarily known for that. That's really a, like a Lennox Lewis type move. Tyson Fury is not necessarily known for a big, sharp right hand over the opponent's jab, but he has been working it, as I say, with Sugar Hill Stewart now for a number of fights. And that's the kind of thing that he'd be teaching him. That's the kind of thing that the Kronk Gym were famous for. You know, they were big on you know, right hands over the jab and stuff like that. So yeah, let's see what happens here. But let me know what you guys think about this footage. What do you think Tyson Fury is actually weighing here? Do you, like me, suspect that he's going to be lighter than he was for his past couple fights based upon this footage. Again, I could be wrong. It, you know, the camera can be misleading, but, and this is from a side angle, right? So that again could be misleading, but based upon how he looks here, he seems to be lighter than he was in Wilder 2 and Wilder 3. Certainly Wilder 3, he looks lighter here, and possibly Wilder 2 as well. Do you think that that is because he plans to move, as I suspect? Uh, plans to keep it long? Or do you just think that he's more motivated? And, and that's one thing I will say as well, based upon a press conference, which I'll do a separate video on, the Zoom press conference, Tyson Fury to me seems in a better place than he was going into the third Wilder fight. To me, he seems more focused. He seems more on it. 
Uh, he seems just happier. And yeah, to me, this is more positive signs from Tyson Fury than I saw going into the Wilder Trilogy fight. Not that the Wilder Trilogy fight was a disaster in terms of the signs that I saw, but he just didn't seem as up for it or focused the third, going into the third fight as he did for the second fight to my eyes. And I think it proved to be the case in the ring. And certainly his trainer said as much after the fight, but here he looks focused again. He doesn't necessarily have the eye of the tiger the way he did going into the second Wilder fight, seek so and destroy. To me, he looks like he's on it in terms of that movement, hit and don't get hit, frustrate Dylan White, and then maybe look to take him out in the second half of the fight, if that's feasible. So yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments below.